The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. LinkedIn presents. The evidence very clearly tells us that immigrants are neither villains nor victims. They don't need your fear, nor do they need your pity. In fact, they're net positive contributors to everything that you want for your community, your country, your society to be successful. It's Thursday. I'm Michael Kovnat, and this is the next Big Idea Daily. Big ideas from big thinkers in under 15 minutes. To stay even more informed and inspired, sign up for one of our newsletters using the link in the episode notes. And if you're not already subscribed to the show, make sure you hit the follow button in your podcast player. Now today, let's dip our toes into a controversial topic, immigration. Now, there are a few ways you could look at migrants. You could see them as a threat to American jobs and culture, or you could see them as innocents in need of a better life, who we citizens have a moral duty to help. Well, neither of those narratives is quite right, according to Zeke Hernandez, author of the new book, The Truth About Immigration, Why Successful Societies Welcome Newcomers. Zeke teaches at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, and he was selected by poets and quants as one of the best 40 under 40 business professors in the world. Here he is to share his big ideas. You're exposed to two dominant narratives about immigrants. One of them is that immigrants are villains, that they're here to hurt you, to steal your job, to threaten your safety, to undermine your precious culture. The other is the victim narrative. It's the idea that immigrants are the poor, huddled masses that deserve our compassion, even if it costs us very much to welcome them. Now, the villain narrative is very familiar to all of us who follow politics, even tangentially. It's the basic platform of some political parties in many countries around the world. And the victim narrative tends to be the default argument for those who are more in favor of immigrants. It's very moral. Uh, but to be honest, it's a little bit of a weak argument because it doesn't stir the passions of people as much as the villain narrative does. After nearly doing 20 years of research on this, the evidence very clearly tells us that immigrants are neither villains nor victims. They don't need your fear, nor do they need your pity. In fact, they're net positive contributors to everything that you want for your community, your country, your society to be successful. Whatever's on your wish list, whether it's cultural vitality, demographic balance, safety, investment, job creation, innovation, economic growth, and so much more, we have reason to be factually optimistic about welcoming newcomers. And not because it's good for them, although it is, but because it's good for us. We miss four of the five major economic benefits immigrants bring in our public conversations about the topic. I want you to imagine trying to make a cake with only flour, but leaving out sugar, eggs, chocolate, and butter. Now, that makes no sense. You can't really make a cake or have a good recipe that way. And yet, that's exactly what we do when we talk about the way immigrants affect us economically. We focus on only one ingredient and we miss the other four major ingredients. If you ever get into a conversation about immigrants in the economy, it almost always begins and ends with this very contentious question about whether immigrants steal jobs from native workers. Those that are skeptical of immigrants argue that they do. Those that are in favor of immigrants point out that no, in fact, immigrants fill labor shortages in critical sectors of the economy like farming or manufacturing or in areas of the economy that require STEM skills. And that turns out actually to be true. But just like in the cake analogy, there's so much more than that. The real tragedy in how we talk about immigrants in the economy is that we get stuck on the question of jobs and wages, which is only one of the five key ingredients essential for a healthy economy. Those ingredients are, by the way, one, investment, two, innovation, three, jobs, four, talent, and five, taxes. And the short of it is that immigrants contribute positively to all five of those. That is, they bring a lot of those ingredients and they bring a great variety of each of those five ingredients. 
But let me at least illustrate one of those benefits with a story. It turns out that if I ask you, which is one of the fastest growing restaurant chains in the United States, you probably wouldn't guess that one of them comes from the country of Guatemala, of all places. This restaurant is called Pollo Campero. You might have seen one in your community. Maybe you haven't. Pollo Campero means country chicken. Think of it as a competitor to KFC or Chick-fil-A uh, or that kind of restaurant. Now, this company was started in Guatemala, and it has become, over the years, the favorite fast food in the region. In the early 2000s, the managers of this company started noticing that flights from Central America to the United States reeked of fried chicken because it was obligatory for anyone visiting their friends and relatives living in the United States to bring chicken from Pollo Campero on the plane. Now, in the years preceding that, there had been mass emigration from Central America to many parts of the United States. And so seeing this, the managers of Pollo Campero decided to try their luck in America. They opened a restaurant in Los Angeles thinking that they would be happy if they sold, you know, a little bit in their first year. And the lines were out the door. And this became the beginning of a very successful growth strategy for this business throughout the United States. Today, there are over 100 uh, of these restaurants throughout the country. Uh, they have followed a strategy of locating neighborhoods that have high Hispanic populations. But here's a really interesting part. These restaurants have meant that this company has invested millions and millions of dollars in the U.S. economy and created many thousands of jobs, even by a conservative estimate. And this is an illustration of something that we see in the data again and again, that where immigrants settle, investment from their home countries follows. This is uh, often referred to as the investment, immigration, jobs triangle. Immigrants arrive, some years later, investment follows, and that creates jobs and creates prosperity in local communities. And it doesn't apply just to restaurants or ethnic foods. It applies to businesses from all sectors, including high-tech, high-paying jobs in the economy. New people, when they arrive in your community, they don't just consume limited resources. They enlarge the pool of resources and make the economic pie bigger because they bring those five key ingredients. Don't worry about assimilation. Instead, focus on integration. Back when World War I was raging and the United States was getting involved in it, the largest ethnic group in the United States was German Americans. People were very worried that because uh, Germany was the big foe during World War I, that Germans would not be loyal to the United States, that they hadn't assimilated sufficiently to American culture and values. And there was a systematic campaign of, quote, Americanization that was designed to force Germans to adopt American values and the English language to prevent German children from learning German in schools, etc. This backfired spectacularly. Instead of motivating German Americans to adopt American values, this became a threat to their German identity and caused them to double down on their German language and their German heritage. Now, this is a story that illustrates something really critical and really current. That is that despite the economic benefits that immigrants bring, much of the opposition to newcomers stems from concerns that immigrants won't adopt the precious cultural, social, and political values that define the receiving nation. Even worse, what if they end up changing some of those things? And so the common demand, often angry demand, is that immigrants have to assimilate. Now, the research I've done on this topic really surprised me. I learned at least two things that everybody should know. First, it's that actually the immigrants that most successfully integrate into society are those that preserve rather than abandon their original culture. Why? Because cultures aren't competing with one another. It's not that you have to choose, say, German or American culture. You can be highly attached to both. And in fact, the people who are attached to both their mother culture and the new culture are more successful at adopting to the receiving culture. And that's why policies aimed at forcing foreigners to abandon their original culture backfire in the same way they did for German Americans 100 years ago. Immigrants already have a very powerful incentive to adapt, and history and evidence show that they will. In fact, this brings us to the second thing that is surprising and interesting, 
it's that remarkably immigrants today integrate into American society at the same rate as they did even 100 years ago. So whether it was Germans, Italians, Poles, Jews 100 years ago, or Asians and Latin Americans today, whether it's economic or cultural integration, you see the same rate of assimilation as ever. You see it, for example, in things like how their earnings catch up with the U.S. born, how quickly they learn English, how quickly they move out of ethnic neighborhoods, or how quickly their children uh, are given native-born names. The point is that the next time you have a conversation about how immigrants might be affecting your beloved country, remember that the best outcome is integration rather than assimilation. Unauthorized immigration is our own fault, and we can fix it. Now, the most common question I get from people, particularly in the United States, goes something like this. Okay, a lot of what you're telling us about immigrants' contributions to the economy, a lot of what you're telling us about their success in integrating to society is true if we're talking about legal immigrants. But what about illegal immigrants? Now, of course, that's a great question because it is true that many countries, especially the United States, have very large populations of unauthorized immigrants. In the U.S., just about a quarter or about 11 million people are in the country without authorization. Undoubtedly, that's a big issue, a big problem. But most of the anger and misunderstanding comes from a severe misconception about why we have such a large undocumented population. There's a very common lay theory that the root cause of illegal immigration is a bunch of bad actors who are breaking the law, and thus the solution is to ratchet up enforcement at the border, hire more police, invest more resources in the border, build a wall. We have more than six decades of experience proving that that simply doesn't work. In fact, it does the opposite. Why? Because what the evidence shows very clearly is that the root cause of illegal immigration is that our legal system simply does not allow sufficient people to fill our economic, humanitarian, and family needs. Let me give you an example. If I'm being extremely generous, our legal system allows us to let in about half a million new people who join the workforce each year, all right? Now, the reality is much less than that, but let's be generous and say it's about half a million. That doesn't even replace the 700,000 people in prime working age who die each year, let alone those who are entering retirement, and not to mention the hundreds of thousands more that we need to power an ever-growing and ever more complex economy or for people to reunite with their families. In fact, the last time we updated the number of legal visas that we give was in 1990, nearly 35 years ago. Back then, the economy was $9 trillion. Today, it's $25 trillion. So the economy has more than doubled in size, and yet we're not letting in enough people even for an economy that was less than half the size. Imagine that you have a superhighway going through your state. Think of the biggest interstate highway where you live. And now imagine that instead of the normal, say, 65 miles per hour speed limit, I set a speed limit of 25 miles per hour on the highway. What's going to happen? Well, I can assure you that very few people are going to obey that speed limit simply because it doesn't make sense, not because they're bad actors. That's kind of what's going on with our legal immigration system. It's so divorced from reality that it incentivizes by itself irregular immigration. That's why evidence shows that the best way to eliminate irregular or illegal immigration is to allow more legal pathways. So it's a problem of our own creation. When the system doesn't match reality, you get irregular immigration channels that serve as a dysfunctional way to try and match that reality. Now, one more point about this that's very important. And let me illustrate this with a story. My barber is living in the United States without authorization. He confessed this to me after us getting to know each other over many years. He's also extremely good at, who, at what he does. There's always a line of people waiting to get their hair cut. One day, he shared with me that his dream has always been to own his own barber shop. And then he told me something that nearly made me fall off my chair. He said that he has saved nearly $200,000 to start his own barber shop. And uh, my eyes almost popped out of their sockets. And I asked him, well, why don't you just go ahead and do this? And he told me that he's unable to because his legal status prevents him from starting this business. Now, my community is missing out on the taxes and jobs and talent 
of someone like my barber. And when you multiply that by 11 million unauthorized immigrants, you see that we are hurt by keeping these people in a permanent unauthorized status. After nearly 20 years of studying this, I can tell you that study after study, anecdote after anecdote, tells us that we can credibly expect newcomers to make our society more successful. And this isn't a conclusion that comes from partisanship or blind faith. Based on the available evidence, it's the truth about immigration. Thank you, Zeke. All right, everyone, get yourself a copy of The Truth About Immigration at your favorite bookstore. And if you like today's show, how about giving us a rating or review in your podcast player to help others find it? Remember, if you want to have big ideas like this right in your pocket, head over to your app store and download the Next Big Idea app. I'm Michael Kovnett. See you tomorrow.